the Tuscarora Nation held possession of a large part of what is now North Carolina for centuries. The permanent arrival of European immigrants changed that. This is a story of the clash between two cultures. Prior to Columbus, North America was home to hundreds of nations. Our story concerns those native people who inhabited what is now Eastern Carolina and lived in a section about one third the size of North Carolina today, the Tuscarora. Prior to Columbus, the land was bountiful with trees. They stretched from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Fish and game food abounded. This was like the Garden of Eden. You know, the trees were so tall that you, could, you couldn't see daylight. The fish were, the rivers were so plentiful. We had eastern sturgeons. They're so plentiful, you could walk on the backs of the fish. We were called the Scaruri, um, the Scaruriaga and the shirt wearers. Scaruri is the uh, hemp plant. And the male hemp plant was made into fibers and was made into long shirts. And so we wore um, long shirts and yes, we had tribal tattoos. Um, each thing would mean something different. Like the, the one that I have, it tells who I am. Um, my children also have their own tribal clan totem on them. Um, we wore leggings only in the winter. The guys wore the breech cloths that came up and they could also take it off when they were out hunting or fishing and lay on it. People don't know that, but uh, it rolled over. But uh, we were the shirt wearers. We, we, um, we didn't wear a lot of gingham because, of course, gingham wasn't here then. So it was hemp shirts and, and deer hides. We also wore you know, deer hides and the knee-high moccasins or the ankle highs in the summer. Tuscarora villages were about 20 miles apart as evidenced on this map depicting towns in the early 1700s. Chitoka, Core Tom's village, was near Newburn. In this section, Katekna, at or near Grifton. Ukonra Hunt, at or near Greenville. Chunanitz, indicated as Inanitz, at or near present-day Snow Hill. Harata, near present Kinston. Here is the village of the Algonquin people at Sakota, near present-day Bath. A drawing of the Tuscarora near this time indicates a similar arrangement. Each village had longhouse dwellings for about seven families, up to 50 feet long and 20 feet wide. In this illustration, squash and other vegetables to the right, tobacco far right, sunflower and other plants to the left a ceremonial area to the lower right. Center appears to be a food preparation area. So hydrating in contrast between the native population is closer to what we would consider now in many ways because they did bathe regularly and um, even though they were more exposed to the elements um, many times they were um, they were more comfortable with being exposed to the elements cold heat and wind and things like that 
Europeans at the time were very closed. Um, they stayed indoors. It was not considered healthy at all to be outdoors for long periods of time. And they also had a prejudice against bathing. Part of it was just practical. Many of the poorer people had no access to fresh water to bathe. But also there was a philosophy amongst the Europeans that uh, bathing was not always desirable, that it exposed you to elements that they tried to keep protected, uh, they, or they tried to keep uh, pr being protected from. Yet they say we were nasty and we were heathens and we were the savages here. And, and it's like, okay, but you could smell you 10 miles down the road in the woods. So, and we and down here, you know, it being so hot, you had to wash a lot because that the bear grease would get rancid. And, and sometimes we put clay on our skin because the clay would protect us from the sun and it also would protect us from mosquitoes. But, um, and, and they would call that paint and sometimes we'd put our paint on, of course, you know, anything to help protect our skin, but actually our skin was very tender. Uh, we knew when to stay out, out of the sun. We knew when to stay in the shade. The Tuscarora leader was a chief or king appointed by women. history of the people say that the Tuscarora came from the Iroquois Confederacy hundreds of years before and settled in the sand hills of North Carolina. The medicine of native people was based on herbs and other natural remedies along with religious practices. times that people, you can talk to people and it's going to be a natural medicine. And uh, with the natural things out there, that uh, there's uh, trees. The tree, uh, pine tree, and the cedar tree, and the weedle, willow tree is medicine. And uh, the pine it's uh, sore for throats and things. Uh, the cedar is sugar diabetes. The uh, natives used were ones that we would consider uh, herbs now, that we would recognize. Things like echinacea, which is now very well known as an immune stimulator and used for colds, flus, and all kinds of other immune conditions was one of the herbals that they used extensively. Also, uh, white willow, which is uh, an herb that uh, in its extract form is uh, was used to make aspirin, was also another one that was widespread use. Also other herbs such as yarrow, uh, yarrow is not as familiar now, but it is one that was used as well for fevers and for uh, helping with all kinds of acute immune conditions. Uh, natural, what they call the natural things, they wouldn't, they didn't have to do anything, but they just eat the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the medicines that's here, and it's still here. Like I said, it's the pine, the, the willow, and the, well, even the oak tree. Oak tree is a, a medicine. It's got medicine in it. All the trees has got type of medicine in it. Well, now we see that many of the medicines, uh, like echinacea, are very popular once again, or herbals that the native populations use. They're becoming popular once again, and we 
have actually found that in research, when you look at some of these medicinals that they used, that they actually have many legitimate uses uh, now in uh, well in Western herbalism, and most Western herbalists uh, do use many of the uh, native herbals extensively. So we're starting to see science kind of catch up to the knowledge that the natives held and, and still have passed down generation to generation. Um, they also, uh, you know, because their medicine people kind of held that knowledge in their culture, uh, we're fortunate that many of those medicine people um, will share the knowledge with uh, herbalists today. It is believed that the Spanish brought the first wave of European diseases to the native people, smallpox, measles, syphilis, gonorrhea. By the 1700s, possibly millions of native people were killed by these diseases. We had medicines for our own diseases that we had never come in contact with measles, mumps, rubella, syphilis, gonorrhea, you know, anything like that. We had never come in contact with that, you know, the, the, the cowpox and, you know, smallpox and, you know, all these inoculations, of course, we had no natural resistance to the, any of them. Well, the native people here were not immune to a lot of the diseases that Europeans brought over when they settled here. You, in order for you to be immune to a disease, someone, either you or sometimes just your ancestors, needs to have been exposed to that disease. So that builds up a natural immunity in the population. Because these diseases that many of the Europeans brought over were completely novel, the uh, native populations here had no defenses against, it, against them. And so you see very high rates of some of these epidemic disease, diseases that um, were brought over. And because there, were, uh, uh, there was no knowledge about these diseases, there was often ineffective treatments among the natives themselves to try to treat these diseases. And when they uh, really decimated some of the populations, it was uh, an incredible loss, uh, very uh, high amounts, nothing like we see now in modern medicine. The loss of native people to diseases was extensive. Estimates vary as high as 70%. The mid-1600s saw the slave trade increase. Some were kidnapped and taken to New England. By 1665, the colony of Barbados, Charleston, South Carolina, was heavy into slave trading. West Africans were captured and sold in Charleston. The slave trade was big business. Native people were sold two for one, two Indians for one African. The native people, including many Tuscarora, were sent to the rum and sugar plantations in Barbados and other Caribbean islands to work. Owners would often provide bare sustenance to the native people. The biggest problems was the Indian slave trade and that the Tuscaroras down along, particularly along Contentnia Creek, were increasingly becoming targets of slave raiders out of South Carolina. South Carolina, that colony was the master of the Indian slave trade. And uh, their pretty much belief was, was that almost any Indian was susceptible to capture and they could be enslaved and put to work on plantations in South Carolina, sold to other colonies, but particularly sold to Barbados. These sugar colonies where just the life expectancy of slaves was, you know, a year or two. It was just, just uh, a trip into hell. We, when they sent us to Barbados, a lot of our people down to Barbados, they chose to die. Death was preferable to being a slave, and death was easier. We're not afraid of death. We're not afraid of dying. And what they did is displace people on two continents. The African slaves that they brought in 
had no natural knowledge of how to survive in another continent. Our people going down to the sugar plantations in Barbados, we had no way of knowing how to survive there. And some of our people made their own poison and went ahead and killed themselves. A series of charters by King Charles II of England granted ownership of North Carolina to a group known as the Lord's Proprietors, starting in 1663. The Tuscarora were extremely angry over the kidnapping of women and children into slavery, but the grievances did not end there. The abuse of Indians by settlers. Uh, as more and more settlers came in, it meant that these two peoples are rubbing elbows together and their culture was just very different. Uh, Englishmen felt that they were superior, that uh, as, as white Englishmen they were superior to Indians and Africans and African Americans and there were no rights that Indians had that they felt they should abide by or had to abide by. Um, so they would often uh, abuse Indian women, rape wives and daughters, they would steal canoes, they would use alcohol and get people drunk, they would beat up Indians that they found uh, walking among the plantations, as they said. So Indians were very tired of this abuse. Another issue was land loss. As more and more Englishmen came in, that meant corresponding less and less land. Indians needed a lot of land. Not only were they farmers, but they were hunters, so they had hunting quarters. And so in the fall of the year, they would often leave their towns and go live in these hunting quarters. And in these hunting quarters, one of the best ways to get game was to burn the forest. And so it would chase the animals, and then they could get the animals. But it also was good for the forest, all of these controlled burns. Uh, they cleared out the underbrush, it brought in fresh grass, which attracted the deer. Uh, there were many plants that needed to have burning to make them flower. On the other hand, the Englishmen didn't like that. To see beautiful stands of timber going up in flames was going against their, their profit motive there. They could use this for firewood, they could use this wood for a lot of things. So they didn't like the way Indians burned the woods. They didn't like to see Indian who, in looking for food, would go among the plant and shoot down cattle or horses or something for food. So both people are having a lot of problems with each other. The expansion of white settlement continued. In addition to the influx of settlers, King James I of England pardoned prisoners in English jails and sent them to the New World. Plantations were starting in earnest in Eastern Carolina by the late 1600s. In May 1700, John Lawson left London for the New World. Upon arrival in Charleston, South Carolina, a while later, he was appointed Surveyor General by the Lord's Proprietors. The title was granted in December 1700. The same month, Lawson departed Charleston, South Carolina to survey what is now North Carolina. His company included six Englishmen, four Indians, one being a woman. A book of his travels was later published in London. In a detailed narrative, Lawson tells of the natives' way of life. Additionally, he collected specimens and described the plants and wildlife of the area. 
These images are from Lawson's book. Lawson also noted in his journal the massive profit made by white traders from purchasing pelts and other items. He noted the use of African slaves among the French Huguenot settlers in South Carolina. Lawson noted the devastating effect of syphilis and smallpox rampant among the native people at that time. Medical procedures were also noted, the effect of herbs and religious practices. Lawson noted the immense wildlife in one village along the way that had over 100 gallons of pigeon oil used for cooking. The Tuscarora Lawson met were displeased with the encroachment of hunters and settlers in their territory. He met a hunting party of 500. In one village only corn was available. Lawson and his party continued to travel in eastern Carolina, winding up in Bath in 1701. The initial work of surveying eastern Carolina made way for more plantations, more settlers, more conflict. In 1705, the town of Bath was founded. This small community was settled primarily by Quakers from the north and by some English, including surveyor John Lawson. In 1709, Baron Christoph de Graffenried a Swiss baron was granted 10,000 acres in the New World by the Lord's proprietors. He set sail in 1710 from England along with John Lawson, who was in London at the time. With him was a large group of Swiss and German Palatine, a fundamental Calvinist group. French pirates took most of the possessions at sea of the immigrants and many died before seeing the New World. The long voyage lasted 13 weeks. Newburn was established initially with about 400 settlers. More settlers came on a subsequent voyage. As with many other immigrants, they were seeking religious freedom and a new start. Uh, French Huguenots also came in, a part of the uh, uh, Palatine, part of that movie, also the French Huguenots that came in also. Again, for the same reasons, religious pressure from Louis XIV. Um, it was not safe for them in their lands of eastern France, even though some still exist there today. And there's a strong, strong Calvinist movement in that area. It's the second largest uh, portion of the church there, uh, Catholicism being number one, but Calvinism being number two in France. But many of them had to either hide their reformed beliefs or Margaret. Baron de Graffenried was a rogue baron from Switzerland who had been exiled uh, to the New World. He brought in 600 Swiss and German Palatines. And they were, like they said, we already had the French Huguenots here, and so we already knew about their religion. And then the, he brings in the German and the Swiss, and then he names Cortom's village. He claims it as his own, and he named it after the Bern Syndicate in Switzerland. And the Germans came in, and they had their own, I guess, customs and religious beliefs, and they were different from the Huguenots. And they, um, the French were a much more likable people, uh, much, much less, um, I don't know how you say it, um, like ownership, they, they don't think that they could own anything, you know, they didn't come in and want to own us.
The further inland movement of European settlers along with the slave issue presented the Tuscarora with a continuing dilemma. On July 10, 1710, the Tuscarora sent two representatives to the Conestoga in Pennsylvania to seek a peaceful place to live. The Tuscarora Confederacy presented eight wampum belts, a treasure of immense value to the delegation. However, the government of Pennsylvania needed a letter of assurance from the government of North Carolina. These Indian slave raids got so bad that in 1710, a group of uh, Tuscarora chiefs in North Carolina actually traveled up to Pennsylvania and met with both Pennsylvania officials, New York officials, the five nations of the Iroquois, uh, met with them and asked to be allowed to relocate up there and put themselves under the, uh, the protection of the five nations because these uh, slave raids out of South Carolina were becoming intolerable. And the five nations were all for it, but the Pennsylvania and North Carolina governments are a little wary of this and, and said that, well, we're not against it, but you got to get a pay, like a, a certificate of good behavior from uh, the North Carolina government. The North Carolina government wasn't going to let them go. They wanted them there. They were at least trade partners. Uh, they were the, their tributaries, as they thought. And so nothing happened. The Indians were left to, 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 to remain there uh, and be subject to these raids. And so you get their, their anger just simmered. And then kind of adding fuel to all this, and this can't be uh, discounted here, um, was that there were many members of the Senecas, the, the westernmost of the five nations. And after 1701, when the Iroquois had signed a treaty with France, uh, they couldn't attack into France anymore. So really the only way to take prisoners, to fight and get that glory, was to go south. And so they looked at those Suan enemies of their Tuscarora cousin. And so many, many Senecas were going south into the Tuscarora villages, and they saw what was happening to their North Carolina Tuscarora cousin, and they began to urge them, go to war. Go to war. Why do you put up with this? You're just slaves of these Englishmen. Why, instead of trading for these goods that you want, why not just kill the English and that way you'd have them. And if you do go to war, we'll send you plenty of weapons. We'll send you ammunition. And then you got to remember is that the five nations, the Senecas, were probably the most feared Indians in North America at this time. The, the French were afraid of them. The English were afraid of them. Even the Tuscaroras were afraid of them. So you have possibly scores of Seneca ambassadors and warriors down among these Tuscarora villages saying, almost appealing uh, to... Uh, uh, Tuscarora masculinity, you're, you're nothing more than women, you've got to fight back. And so hearing this, it's this kind of talk that gets these warriors who are willing to go against their own chief, Hancock, and press for war. So Near Bath in 1711, amidst all this, a short rebellion led by Colonel Thomas Carey was quickly extinguished. At that time, the Quakers and the Anglican government were arguing over religious and taxation issues. Since Quakers are generally against fighting, Carey's forces were probably non-Quakers. Lawson was uh, from England, had studied as an apothecary, and so he had, by that, he had learned about plants, he had also learned to sketch very well. He had come to North Carolina, excuse me, South Carolina, in like uh, 1700 and in December 1700 and into uh, the spring of 1701 he and some companions had made this great trip across the, the Piedmont of uh, South and North Carolina he winding up at the town of Bath and he had pretty much stayed in North Carolina ever since. He became one of those men, one of these kind of adventurers he had written about his trip, he wrote Natural History of North Carolina eventually became the surveyor general, and so became very much one of the you know, uh, colonial men of the time. Uh, the Grafenried was from Switzerland. He was kind of a near-do-well, but uh, eventually kind of wanted to save the world. 
and the way he was going to do this was to relocate uh, Palatines from uh, southwestern Germany uh, to uh, to America, and he met up with Lawson in London, and Lawson convinced him that North Carolina was the place to go. And in uh, 1709, 1710, they brought about 350, that's about who survived, Palatines and Swiss, and just more or less dumped them right down at uh, where New Bern is today. And so probably by the second week of September in 1711, the two men decided to take a trip up the Neuse River more or less to see the lay of the land. Uh, I suppose he said there were wild grapes up there, but in reality what they're looking for is land where they could, uh, uh, the colony could expand. Uh, the uh, the Graffenried is looking to, uh, to move people up the river. They're also looking to maybe blaze a better trail from that area up the Noose to Virginia. And so they decide that they're going to take a boat along with some horses. They would have an Indian guide who would use uh, the horse and travel up and scout for them. And they had two uh, African or African-American slaves that would row the boat. And so they begin going upriver and they, they pass uh, Contentnia Creek uh, where that uh, comes into the noose, continue on up the noose. But they're traveling into Tuscarora territory, and by not meeting up, by not going to see uh, King Hancock, who, uh, who was more or less one of the main leaders of these Tuscaroras along Contentnia Creek, and along Contentnia Creek they have a whole series of Tuscarora towns, um, as they'd gone up the noose, they haven't more or less asked for permission to go into Tuscarora territory, and word of this got back to uh, uh, King Hancock at his town of Katechna, about where Grifton, North Carolina is today. Uh, he sends a party of warriors with more or less the idea that they were to turn them back, uh, that these men were to, uh, what are you doing up here? You should have come see me first. We, know, we think we know what you're doing and you're wanting to take our land. You should go back and come back and present yourself to Hancock. However, things got quickly out of hand, though Hancock, and uh, he's under some pressure at this point between some of his younger men along with some of their uh, uh, five nation of the Iroquois allies out of New York, wanting them to kind of start a war, but Hancock also realized that uh, going to war against the English was not necessarily the best thing to do. So he wants them turned back, but instead his party of warriors decide to capture de Graffenreid and uh, uh, Lawson and their slaves, and they do. They then almost frog march him back to Katechna, and there Hancock, King Hancock of the Tuscarora, is a chief, as you would call, of, uh, of what, we would, what we use today of this town of Katechna, and, and very much an important um, a man, a Tuscarora man along this, this creek here, finds himself in a tough situation with his young men and his uh, Five Nation guests pressing for, uh, to execute them. And uh, he realized that's not what he wants to do, but he's under intense pressure. Uh, there seems to be a, an early attempt to try and get these men released. Uh, they are brought in front of the fire. They're more or less sat down. They're, they're still kind of giving a, a place of honor. There are mats for them. Uh, they are, Hancock questions them, what are you doing? And, and, and the minister, they, they mention nothing about looking at land. Uh, you know, all we want to do is uh, look for grapes, and we're looking to expedite trade with the Tuscarora. They're trying to be as innocent as they can. It really looks like this has worked by the end of this trial, which lasts for several hours, in fact, maybe even a whole day into the night. Um, even though there are some of, um, of Hancock's men who are saying, look, these men, are they abuse us, and they start giving this litany of, uh, of troubles that they have with the settlers. But still, by, by the end of the day, they are more or less given, okay, you're going to be released and sent back. And so... 
this all seems well. But Hancock had also sent runners to other villages asking for their chiefs to show up. And so the next morning, as they were getting ready to leave as uh, Lawson and uh, their slaves and the Grafenreed are getting their thing together, for whatever reason, they're delayed a little bit. And one of the, I guess, more unfortunate coincidences of history is that gives time for several of these other chiefs to come about. And one of these is a man by the name of Cor Tom. Uh, there's a lot of speculation on who Cor Tom is. I, I believe that he is... a uh, a, uh, a Five Nation agent provocateur. Uh, he's met de Graffenreid before, and de Graffenreid knows that Cor Tom does not like him, does not like the, the English, does not like his colonists. Cor Tom is all for it, and more or less Cor Tom comes in and upsets King Hancock's apple cart. Instead, he demands another trial, and this just breaks into confusion. And this is where more and more of the Indians are talking about how they've been abused and how Lawson is one of the abusers, willing to use alcohol to cheat them out of land. And pretty soon an argument develops between Cor Tom and Lawson, and Lawson just, his temper gets the best of him. He, uh, he gets angry, he lets his tongue go, he begins to become very insulting, he even begins to threaten the Indians that once I'm out of here, you know what's going to happen to him. And this just turns everyone against him. And, and King Hancock, who thought he had had them released, instead they are, uh, they are now condemned to death. Uh, the Graffin Reed is just beside himself. He's very worried. He is... Uh, really fearing for his life, he's praying. He is finally finds an Indian that can speak English and tells him that, look, I, I, I am your friend. I am, you know, the queen sent me here. If you execute me, or, you know, the queen's gonna come. Um, while this was going on, Han King Hancock had sent another runner, this time up to the north, uh, to King Tom Blunt. Tom Blunt was also a Tuscarora Indian chief, an Indian leader. Uh, more up on the Roanoke River there, on the Pamlico, and then up a little bit further on the Roanoke. And more or less asking him what should they do with Lawson and de Graffenried. And Tom Blunt, who plays an important role in the Tuscarora War, sends back word that let de Graffenried go, but do what you will with Lawson. And so de Graffenried was spared, uh, but not released, while Lawson was... Uh, killed, and there's a lot of debate on how he was killed. He was certainly executed. Um, the most, pro probably what happened, and, and, and seems that the few people who, the Graffin didn't witness it, but other Indians that did said he was actually, his throat was slit with a, a uh, with a straight razor, Lawson's own straight razor. Other, uh, the more, uh, I guess the more uh, um, uh, colorful way was that his, he was tied up and, uh, his body was, he was stuck with all sorts of little splinters of pitch pine, and they were eventually lit on fire, and he was killed that way. He Lawson was executed, and so was what they called the big slave. The little slave was not uh, executed, but uh, he was never seen again. Uh, the Graffin Reed is, remains a prisoner until about probably late October. These days, about six weeks, and the Graffin Reed then is released, and he makes his way home to find his colony and his town of New Bern in shambles. September 22, 1711, began as any other day. The settlers along the rivers of East Carolina were unaware of an imminent danger. The Tuscarora along the Noose were angry at the encroachment of their land by settlers and of the years of selling their women and children into slavery, and they sought revenge. King Blunt's people along the Pamlico did not participate. However, King Hancock's war parties formed along Contentnia Creek and the Noose, leaving their villages around sunrise on that day. Down the Pamlico and the Noose Rivers, groups of war parties went. 
some settlers escaped by hiding, but a bloodbath ensued. The war parties went all the way to Bath and Newburn. Men, women, children were killed. Some were spared and taken to King Hancock's village at Katekna. The death toll was 130 to 200 settlers. The violence had just begun. North Carolina would never be the same. Surviving settler accounts say that parties of warriors would destroy one settlement, then proceed down the river to the next settlement, repeating the killing. Search parties from Newburn did find some settlers' children in the aftermath. They were taken to the Newburn community, adopted, and comforted. On September 22nd, the lower or the Contentnia Creek Tuscaroosa, along with their core Indian allies and White Oak River allies and Bear River uh, allies and Machapunga allies, uh, all on the morning of September 22nd at dawn, they arranged themselves and at dawn they attacked and they just went across this area between the Pamlico River to the north and actually to the White Oak River in the south and just began <clears throat> sweeping through the forest in their half moon formations. Um, if they could take people unawares, fine. Many people, early risers, they saw any Indians actually knew, greeted them, and once they greeted them, they were attacked uh, all across. And probably the first couple of days of these attacks, uh, about maybe 100, 160 people were killed and an unknown number wounded. Uh, they would bypass strongholds, and some houses did manage. But more and more, uh, just people were killed. It was a surprise attack. Uh, some people were able to get into boats and get away. Some were able to get to these uh, fortified houses, like um, Captain William Bryce's house on Bryce's Creek down right below Newburn. There were there were other, but many more were burned. Many more were killed. Men, women, and children. Killed. But also many were taken captive also and brought back to these villages, these Tuscarora villages along uh, Contentnia Creek. On the other hand, the what we call the northern Tuscaroos, those that lived along the Roanoke River, those who were more or less under the leadership of Tom Blunt, did not participate in the attack. They were much too close to Virginia and North Carolina, uh, the the Albemarle, and I think they believed that if they would have got, they would have been the first ones attacked. So they might have had. Probably several young men probably left, but overall these older chiefs up there did not want to go to war. And they, they didn't go against their people at this time, but they didn't help the English. They didn't make any attack. They really just wanted to be left out of it. But of course the problem is that once the attack started, the governor of Virginia and the governor of North Carolina canceled all trade with them, prohibited all trade to try and get them on the side of the English. And so on that morning of September 22nd, uh, the war began with all of these attacks on, the, on these English. And uh, uh, of course, the English called it a massacre. For the Indian, they were just right and wrong. They were more or less, uh, they weren't trying to necessarily wipe out all the English in North Carolina, but they were more or less trying to, I guess, bring harmony back. More or less saying that, all right, look, you, you pushed us too far. We're coming back now. If you would accept, this as retaliation, we can go back to the way things were, but... After the attacks, Governor Hyde dispatched Major Christopher Gale to Charleston, South Carolina to request help. South Carolina responded by appointing Colonel John Barnwell, an Irishman, 
who mustered 30 white men and nearly 500 Indians of various tribes. So the governor and the uh, House of Representatives of South Carolina are all for this. They appropriate 4,000 pounds to fund an expedition. They put it under command of uh, Colonel John Barnwell, who had come over from Ireland. Um, and uh, he had dealt with Indians before. He was, his place was very close to the Yamasee. He is able to round up lots of Indians. And again, South Carolina is behind them. Uh, and then in December of 1711, he and his army, which initially over 5,000 strong. Now, you only have about 30-something white men, Barnwell and, and a few officers, and, a few, and the rest are Indians, uh, Yamases and Catawbas and Wateries and Usheries and, and you name it, uh, Casabos. There's a whole list of them. That, so you got about 500-something Indians and about 30-something uh, English officers and men. Uh, they leave out, march up through the Piedmont, up and through the Congaree towns, and their, their numbers probably change every day. Some been coming, some been going. They eventually make it up, and uh, one of the, the kind of terribly you know, uh, funny is that the idea was is that when they were making this plan up, Barnwell would march up to the western side of Tuscarora Territory, and he had expected uh, North Carolina to have its troops ready and to have marched across North Carolina and meet him on the west side, which was absolutely crazy of them. Barnwell was an Irishman, and he came over here, and he was one of the most vicious, uh, disgusting human beings. I, I don't even know if you could call him a human being. Um, during his campaigns, he cut across North Carolina with the Yamasee. He brought up about 200 Yamasee from South Carolina with him. And he just laid waste to our villages. And they took a lot of the women and children. And I don't know how many of those he might have kept for himself because the Yamasee got to keep some of them. Um, he just, I guess it was like cattle to them that they just kept whatever they want and sold off the rest. They his men get up there in uh, late January on the west side of, of uh, the villages along Contentnia Creek. Can't find a North Carolina army. There's no food. Or but Barnwell decides <clears throat> to start attacking, and he does. He's able to attack along some of the villages. Uh, uh, Fort Narhantes is first. He's able to take the... These Indians realized, though, they're at the far western end. They were probably surprised by Bar, but not fully surprised is that they'd begin to build forts and blockhouses. So they knew something had to be coming. Uh, Barnwell and his men are able to take the first fort, Fort Narhantes. The next town, Kinta, sent men to attack. They're repulsed. And so now the Indians take a plan where they're just going to withdraw from their towns and they're going to station themselves in a fort at Katechna, King Hancock town. Barnwell finds these empty villages and plunders them and takes their corn. And then essentially instead of attacking uh, Hancock's fort at Katechna, he detaches, moves up north to the Pamlico, marches down to Bath where he expects to find a North Carolina army, but he doesn't. And so Barnwell has come to North Carolina. He has had a couple of victories. Um, North Carolina government's glad to see him. But then Barnwell, kind of his Irish temper, Barnwell just doesn't realize how bad off North Carolina is. It's in sad shape. Uh, he's, he feels, he takes it personally that they don't have men for him, that they don't have supplies for him, they don't have food for him. And so he eventually uh, will kind of move out away from Bath, and he uh, and, and will uh, at some point come down to Newburn, and he starts kind of playing in North Carolina politics. Uh, in doing this, he begins to insult the governor, Governor Hyde, he insults Thomas Pollock, who's a man you don't want to insult, uh, and he just begins to turn a lot of North Carolinians against him. Eventually, he will take, and after he had made his initial attack, he, many of Barnwell's Indian allies had left. They figured, well, you got one attack, they took a lot of slaves, they left. 
And so Barnwell now, by March of 1712, only has uh, uh, his 30-some-odd South Carolinians, about 65, 70 North Carolina militia, and about 130 Indians, and he marches up the noose to go and attack uh, the fort at uh, uh, Hancock's Fort at Katechna. Uh, in the end, he's not able to do it. He, uh, he's not able to defeat the fort. Um, the, the Indians, as he comes out, uh, in fact, he tries to dig trenches to uh, but the Indians sally out. Eventually, as he gets closer and closer, finally the Indians begin to uh, pull out captives that they've taken and say, look, if you come any closer, we're going to kill these uh, hostages. Don't let them kill us. Don't let them kill us. And, of course, Barnwell's men, and Barnwell hears it. And so finally he makes kind of a treaty. We'll back off. We'll go back. Your thing is to release all of these captives, and then any other captives you have, meet us 12 days later down at Bachelor's Creek. And Barnwell retreats back to uh, New Bern, and while they're waiting, sickness hits. And Barnwell gets sick, and some of the Indians get sick, and Barnwell's not able to go uh, to this meeting that he's scheduled uh, at Bachelor's Creek. It doesn't matter when the man he designates to go there, the Indians don't come with any captive. Barnwell feels that he's been uh, more or less tricked by the Indians, and he rounds up again, gets and makes a second attack on Fort Hancock, marches back up, and again, now he finds that Hancock has been, uh, the fort has been reinforced. Um, again, he is unable to subdue it. It just, he's running out of food, and finally he asks to make uh, another treaty, a peace treaty, which goes against the explicit instructions of the North Carolina government. They make a treaty. He says that uh, the, uh, the fort should be burned. He eventually goes, he feels he's got a treaty signed, the Tuscarora signed, the Corps are forced to sign, other Indians, he figured he's done his job. He will eventually go back to New Bern and in late July, uh, late June, early July, will eventually march on heading back to South Carolina. He'll get to the Cape Fear. One of his own men shoots him and wounds him, and he'll be carried back. But essentially, his part was over. A yellow fever epidemic in the colony took the life of many settlers, including Governor Hyde. Hyde died in the fall of 1712. Thomas Pollock became governor. In November 1712, King Hancock was captured and executed by the British. One account relates that King Hancock was invited to go fishing with King Blunt, and it was Blunt who turned over King Hancock to the colonial powers. Violence continued. The colonial government needed a resolution to the hostilities. Once again, Barnwell is barely home before uh, they send word again to South Carolina saying, we need your help again, we need another expedition, have it commanded by anyone but Barnwell, because North Carolina officials hate Barnwell by this time. They, they feel that he had left the Indians off the hook, that he was right there, almost ready for a complete victory, and had pulled his punch, and plus he had waged this war of words with Hyde and, uh, and Pollock. So South Carolina, again, knowing a good opportunity when they see one, that there's more Indian. In fact, that had been one of the inducements from North Carolina. There's still about a 1,000 slaves that you can have up here, Indian slaves. So South Carolina, once again, um, gets up another large army, this time even larger, about almost a 1,000 Indians, but it would be commanded by Colonel James Moore. For many, Moore was an excellent choice. He was the son of a former South Carolina governor, who had amassed immense wealth from the enslavement and sale of native people. His father, James Moore, had defeated the Appalachian in 1704, acquiring 1,000 to 3,000 Indian slaves for his plantation or for sale to the Caribbean. We have great sympathy for the Jewish people, you know, and their Holocaust. Uh, we have great sympathy for the Puritans because of their beliefs and, and the way that they were persecuted by the Catholic Church. But nobody understands that our people were, Adolf Hitler learned what to do to the Jewish people from America. And he went after the Jewish people the same way America did the Native Americans. And that's how he learned what, how to do it, for his perfect race. 
Although it is impossible to assess the true value in today's money of the sale of Indian slaves, a modest estimate can be made. Going price for a Native American slave in 1713 was 10 pounds, or approximately $1,930 in today's money. 1,000 slaves sold at 10 pounds each equals 10,000 pounds, or approximately $1,930,000 today. Moore and his men will leave about in December. They will march up into North Carolina. They will actually march to uh, um, where they see Fort Neil Hiroka near present-day Snow Hill. They'll look at it. That's where the Indians are. Won't make any attack. We'll march all the way back to, we'll continue on to, to um, uh, Bath. At Bath, just like the year before, they don't find any uh, supplies, no army. And this time, Moore, uh, believe me, uh, he's, he's a brilliant commander. His Indians need food. The only place there is food is up in the Albemarle. And so Moore takes all his Indian army, close to a thousand of them, up into the Albemarle, Chowan province, and they begin to just forage for food. This shocks and scares all those people up in the Albemarle. Up there, these Quakers and the old settlers have been able to more or less thumb their nose at the government. They're not doing it, but all of a sudden there's Indians who are just coming by and taking bushels of corn. Even the, even this, this gets to North Carolina, this gets them moving. Now even the Quakers, now the old settlers, now even the political enemies of Pollock turn to start providing food. Moore gets his food, he kind of relocates to Redding's Fort. And then uh, in, in March, after a huge rain delay, he's able to march overland right to Fort Neil Hiroka. And in March of 1713, after a three-day siege, which uh, where you know, Barnwell, the, the, the captives, kind of softened him up. There were no captives at this point, And Moore is willing to risk his men, and they are able to use fire and sword. He actually tried to build a mine to blow up the, these walls. And the Indians have very uh, European-style forts. The According to Colonel Moore's map, a later copy shown here, Fort Niharuka was one and one-half acres in area. Along the walls were bastions and blockhouses. Houses and underground areas were inside the fort. A passageway behind the fort led to Contentnia Creek. Moore had a zigzag trench dug and built a blockhouse near the end of the trench so as to fire directly into the fort. The arrangement of Moore's forces beginning again with the trenches. The trenches can be seen in this old illustration. Colonel James Moore's men are below the trenches and the Yamasee Battery, composed of 88 white men and 400 Indians of several nations. An auxiliary battery is below Moore's forces. The Yamasee Battery directly in front of the fort. The Cherokee encampment of 310 Cherokee and Captain Herford and 10 white men. The Cherokee battery behind the fort. These forts are, are have bastions and redoubts and, and place where you can have crossfire and palisades and they have uh, kind of booby traps or obstacles in the way. But more after about a, a three to four day siege is able to take this fort. Uh, the Indians in a way had had learned the wrong lesson from Barnwell. This time they brought their women and children inside here. They really figured their idea was was to hold out long enough till these armies run out of food. It worked with Barnwell. It didn't work with Moore. Moore was a different type of commander. Um, he was one who he understood that casualties were going to be taken 
and he eventually is able to take this fort, burn it to the ground. Many, uh, close to 300, uh, and maybe even more, are killed. Close to 800 uh, Indians are enslaved. It breaks the back of the, uh, these Tuscaroras along Contentnia Creek. The Tuscarora were crushed. 1,500 Tuscarora were reported fleeing to Virginia. Many fled to the swamps of North Carolina. Newspapers of the era reveal the fate of some of the captured Tuscarora. Many fled north to be accepted as the Sixth Nation in the Iroquois Confederacy in New York in 1722. The nation had vanished, but the influence of the Tuscarora remained with us today, with the Tuscarora on the New York Reservation, the Tuscarora in Ontario, the remnant Tuscarora here in North Carolina, and in other states. But still, the Tuscarora can also be seen today in America's medicine, in America's fruits and vegetables, in America's blood. And at the village of Inuits, they had he made a comment that he only got one little Indian girl that was 10 years old. And this is where my family comes along and it's sad because he had this 10 year old child, he kept her. And within uh, 20 years, all of a sudden they called, okay, let's go back to where Barnwell called every longhouse or every dwelling a castle. Every man's house is a castle. And so the Iroquois way of joining names is me, N-E-Y or N-Y on the end. So this one little girl that he got at 10 years old, 20 years later, we had Barney Castle, which was my family. I was wondering if I could go back in time and talk to Colonel Moore, or go over more than one of and ask him how it would feel that I would be sitting here 300 years talking about what took place in my native home of Green County, and then advising me that I'm a direct descendant of yours. And I'm also a direct descendant of a young lady who grew up in the Indian Woods Reservation and spoke an Algonquin tongue and married the sheriff of Craven County. And even our form of government was influenced by the Tuscarora. For better or for worse, a new nation was about to be born, one declaring a principle of participatory democracy rather than the old monarch system of Europe. Those who would be called the Founding Fathers had, in the early years, heard from a civilization that had a constitution for already hundreds of years. 
the Six Nation Confederacy, the Iroquois, the Mohawks, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, the Seneca, the Tuscarora. Today, just outside of Snow Hill, North Carolina, is the site of Fort Nuhuruka, believed to be the largest mass burial site of Native Americans. The site is on private farmland. For many years, only a marker on Route 58 told of the virtually unknown battle. As I speak, in February 2013, a monument is being constructed near the fort location to remember a nation and a war whose events changed things forever. Perhaps the Tuscarora War, for those living and for those yet to come, will no longer be a forgotten tragedy. <laughs>